the 20s were to prove not so roaring for us southerners, and we began to ring major changes in the hope of recapturing our previous form. One definite plus was the luring from St Kilda of future legend Roy Cazaly. Teamed with rover Mark Napper Tandy, he was the man whose name would become synonymous with the spectacular high mark. When he was joined by brilliant local recruit Ted Johnson, who would top the goal kicking list for six years running, it seemed that at last we had the makings of the potent forward line we were seeking. But somehow it didn't quite pan out that way. Our team went up and down, but spent a disappointing amount of time in the middle ladder doldrums. On the surface, all was going well, as the new grandstand was unveiled in 1926. It mightn't look like much compared to today's luxurious seating, but at the time, it was considered the ultimate in convenience and comfort. It was even celebrated in paintings of the period. However, good amenities were no compensation for lack of on-field success, and as the 30s loomed, it was decided that bold steps had to be taken. This was partly forced on us by outside circumstances. The depression was beginning to hit hard and players went wherever secure employment was offered. One who did stay was centre man Len Thomas, who starred for the Bloods through most of the 30s and went on to captain the team. He was dubbed the Prince of Midfielders. But the Southerners were not content to rely purely on local talent. We cast our recruiting net nationwide particularly in the pool of proven talent available in the West, and it was to provide rich pickings. Among the best of whom was to be Bill Fall, a dashing halfback from Subiaco, who would play over a hundred games for the club and then return to coach in the early 60s when we were no longer officially the Bloods. There are several schools of thought about how South came by their new nickname. One says it was a cynical journalist who suggested that they had so many Western Australians on their list, they might as well be called the Swans. For whatever reason, the name stuck, and it became our new emblem. And as if to salute the new decade, South also made a major change in our playing strip. It would prove to be the last while we remained in Melbourne. But we Swans didn't restrict our hunt to West and South Australia. Locally, we added raw-boned Richmond Ruckman Jack Bissett and from Mitcham, the phenomenal Bob Pratt. A high-marking forward who many considered a brilliant freak. And from Tasmania, although born and bred in Richmond, we secured the mercurial Laurie Nash, a somewhat unique character. He excelled in defense, but could be devastating when moved up the ground. Chunky and cocky, he was never going to be accused of false modesty. Years later, when asked who was the greatest player he ever saw in his career, Nash replied, Son, I see him in the mirror every morning when I shave. With all the imports, the press were quick to label South as the Foreign Legion. But no one could deny that a powerful squad was being forged. And in 1933, all the elements came together. At that year's grand final, we brushed Richmond aside to cruise home by 42 points for our third league premiership. And on form, it suggested that many more were bound to follow. If anything, the squad appeared to have been strengthened with the addition of reliable fullback Jim Cleary, a hard player but so fair that he was known as Gentleman Jim. And at the other end of the field, we unearthed a ruck champion named Jack Graham. Many predicted back-to-back -back flags, at the very least. But football proved as fickle a game as ever. In 34, we came close, but finished runner-up. The next year, there was a freak accident on the Thursday before the big game. Bob Pratt was injured when hit by a truck while getting off a tram. Ironically, the driver was a Swans supporter. Without our champion forward, our game fell apart. And again, we came in second. A repeat performance next year meant we had lost three grand finals in a row. And from there, things started to go into a steady decline. By the end of the 30s, we were languishing last on the ladder, when overseas, the world went to war, yet again. This time, the fighting was to be very much closer to our shores, and many footballers were among the young men who again rushed to sign up. Some, like Len Thomas, would pay the ultimate price. 
He had the distinction of being half of the only father and son combination to both compete in VFL premierships, Bill in 1909 and Len in 1933. But shrinking playing lists were just one of the disruptions to the league. These included the requisitioning of the MCG and Lake Oval for military purposes. Still, though sadly depleted, the competition limped on through the war years and South actually showed signs of improvement. To begin with, Captain Herb Matthews became the club's first Brownlow medalist in 1940. Then there was the addition of two vital new recruits, local boy Ron Clegg and rover Billy Williams, both stars in the making. By the end of 1945, the war was effectively over. The finals were christened the Victory Series, and against predictions, the two teams left standing were the Swans and Carlton. What was to transpire was the most notorious match in the history of the game, the so-called bloodbath. Carlton won both the fight and the game, and it was to prove our last chance at the flag before we went down to North Melbourne in 1996. But what no one in the Swans camp could have known was that for us, an even bigger fight lay ahead.